If you have your Bibles, turn to uh, Luke chapter 23. Uh, if you have a cell phone or any other type of device, uh, you can use that as well. Uh, as well as you're going there, if you are a person that interacts on social media, whether that's Instagram, Twitter, uh, Facebook, whatnot, I invite you to do that during, uh, during our time here, if that helps you process things. Now, that's not to go holler at somebody and try to get a date for after service or to try to play some uh, bejeweled game or something like that, get some more points or whatever the case may be. Don't, don't send me those requests. I don't pay attention to them. Uh, but other than that, you can feel free to engage uh, through social media. Uh, our Instagram and Twitter is at TRC Gary. That's at TRC Gary. And you can do different things that way. You can check your bulletin for more stuff. Um, feel free. But if I see you hollering at your boo thing, that's another story. Anyways. All right. So tonight it's Easter, and I was wondering, I was like, okay, Lord, what, what is it that you want me to speak about? There's so many different things that come into mind at Easter, and then it just kind of sat on me a lot, this passage of Scripture that um, maybe doesn't directly apply to Easter Sunday, but it applies to the whole story. And uh, on your sheet, if you, if you are following a long type of a person and you like to fill in blanks, uh, that's provided in your bulletin. But I always struggle with titles. Some people like to have titles to messages. It helps them. Other people are like, it doesn't really matter. And for those of you who want a title, I put the title Death Row Conversations. That doesn't sound too Easter-like, but um, it is. If we, if we think about death row and not Dr. Dre or Aftermath or any of that death row, some of you are maybe are into hip-hop a little bit, like myself, no, but, but I'm not talking that death row, but death row as in you're about to be taken out for your crimes, there could be some really interesting conversations that take place, right? If you, if you were able to sit down with an inmate or maybe you've been in a, in a situation where you had friends or family in those situations, those conversations that take place on death row, the last conversations, when time's running out, those are important. Those probably hold a lot of value. Maybe bad value, maybe good value. Or maybe, maybe you haven't had those type of situations involving the law, but maybe you know of, of a relative or a friend that was on their deathbed physically. And they're in the hospital and they're, they're, you kind of know they're going to expire sadly soon. And the conversations that you have are meaningful and something that you treasure for a long time. So with that in mind, I want us to go into Luke chapter 23, starting in verse 32. And we're going to read several verses here. And you can follow along that way, or it may be on the screen here that you can follow along as well. And it reads like this. Two others, both criminals, were led out to be executed with him, meaning Jesus. When they came to a place called the skull, they nailed him to the cross, and the criminals were also crucified, one on his right and one on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And the soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice, right? The crowds watched, and the leaders scoffed. He saved others, they said. Let him save himself if he's really God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers mocked him too by offering him a drink of sour wine. Some of you know that taste. They called out to him, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And a sign was fastened above him with these words. This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed. <laughs> so you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself and us too while you're at it. But the other criminal protested. Don't you fear God even when you're sentenced to die? 
We deserve to die for our crimes, but this man hasn't done anything wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. This passage is interesting, especially from the point of view of placing Jesus, the Son of God, this, this revered Rabbi, this somebody that was looked at by a lot of people, especially prior to the whole Passion Week, prior to his conviction and crucifixion, prior to all the trumped up charges and everybody denying him and Peter doing his thing and uh, saying, peace, I don't know this cat, and all that kind of stuff. Prior to it, Jesus was, man, he had popularity. People came around, they, they, they crowded the club where he was there speaking. They crowded the restaurant where he was at. If he was outside, they crowded in. They wanted to see this guy by the name of Jesus. And now things are, are different. But for him to be in the middle of criminals is incredibly odd. But it's not accidental. It's not accidental how Jesus was crucified. 700 years before Jesus was crucified, it was prophesied in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 12, that this would be the manner of which Jesus would die. How odd is the Holy One of God to be numbered among the unholy? Imagine the finger that inscribed the Ten Commandments is now stretched out on a cross that is nasty. Scholars tell us that this form of punishment and death was the worst form of punishment and death that the society had to offer. Gruesome. The Son of God executed and in this way and the placement between two, we know from other passages, robbers, thieves. One on his right, one on his left. Here Jesus was right in the middle. Now, I don't know about you, but when, when, I, when I watch and see where people are placed in different settings, sometimes old school churches have it like this, sometimes you go to banquets, sometimes it's, it's in political scenes where you have multitudes of, uh, or maybe not multitudes, but several people up front, right? And usually the person right in the middle is a focal point, right? In the church, it's the pastor. If, you, if, you, if, if you've been around churches where they have the old school, the, ch the, the chairs on, on, on the platform, right? And you got the big chair in the back and then the smaller chairs down the, down the line. person who sits in the big chair is the, is the pastor. He's the preacher for the, for the night. He's the focal point. The president of the United States doesn't sit far off to the right. He's front and center. By pacing Jesus right in the middle of these two criminals, in essence, they're saying... What Jesus has done is worse than these two. Odd, but yet it's not. Strange, but yet it's not. We need to look at what's the responses of these two robbers? What's these responses of these two thugs? Right? There's some similarities between the two cats. Right? They're, they're in a position where... Their dignity is gone. Being crucified on the cross, there's no more dignity left. They're in a desperate situation. They are guilty of a crime. They've been proven guilty of a crime. They're social outcasts. And both of those thieves, both of those thugs, both of those robbers, those criminals were running out of time. Soon. They would run out of breath or blood, one of the two, and would expire. They were running out of time. But there was differences, drastic differences that are important for us and really, really telling to the whole point of Easter. The one robber was like everyone else who questioned Jesus' divinity and challenged his identity. How often have we done that? Maybe we don't outright say, I don't believe Jesus is God. I don't really, I don't really follow in line. Maybe, maybe we don't outright do that. Maybe 
part of our culture is so much steeped in Christianity that we kind of just assume it and it's just, we just kind of know it. But applied knowledge. I wonder how many of us might be kind of like a homeboy that's up there and just is like, Jesus, man, if you want to help out my mama, Help out my mama, she's hurting and blah, blah, blah. If you would help out my bread, if you would help out my pockets, then I know you're Jesus. But you haven't done that at all, so bump you. We may not say that, but in the heart. Or maybe things aren't just going my way. There's a second robber. He confessed that he was jacked up. That he was a sinner. He was repentant and he acknowledged that he needed a savior. He cried out to Jesus and was like, I ain't got any other option. I've done everything. And I know you're innocent. And I recognize your identity, Jesus. And I'm going to trust you at the point where I have no other option. And sometimes I know, I've, I've been in settings before, I, I've worked with teens, adults, whomever, and I've been in settings where people would say, you know what, pastor, or before even becoming a pastor, you know what, Ryan, you know what, DJ, you know what, whatever they call me, not now. When I'm older, when I get done smoking this after I empty this fifth when I'm done with this hustle when I get done with old girl when I get my house in order then but notice this robber this, this thief this criminal this thug he, he's, he has no possible way to get anything in order He simply believes in Jesus. Now watch what Jesus says. He flips around and he was like, I see you. I know you're real. You, you, you got it. You don't have to wait. You're going to be with me in paradise. Cool story. But the importance of Jesus' position on the cross dramatically depicts even what the cartoon with the shortest time was saying, Jesus took our place. In theological terms, it's called substitutionary atonement. Don't get caught up in that unless you like that kind of stuff, then you can get caught up in it. In other words, he just took your place. The thing is, Sometimes we see Jesus' crucifixion in really jacked up viewpoints because sometimes we really want to whitewash it. And that's not a racial thing. That's Y'all follow me. We, we, we want to scrub it clean and sanitize it and make it so it's not quite as ugly and dramatic as what it really is and kind of ascribe some nice, neat little reasons of why Jesus was crucified. Jesus was not murdered for politics. This week I, I read some online discussions and people were trying to assert that Jesus was murdered for his political views. This is not the case. Just a quick glance through history would clearly show that. Jesus was not murdered because he was a criminal. He was innocent. Jesus was not murdered because he was a good guy with principles and values. Right? It wasn't because Jesus was so good that he had haters and the haters going to hate, 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 so they killed him. That was not the reason why Jesus died on the cross. Jesus didn't die. Jesus wasn't murdered because he snitched on somebody for something else they were doing. Jesus was murdered because of his claim to divinity. 
He said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one can come to the Father except by me. When he said, I am, every religious person in the area that did not believe in Jesus had a fit because they knew what that statement, I am, meant. Because they knew Old Testament, their scriptures at the time, that God's name was, I am that I am. And Jesus, to say that, was in their eyes, blasphemy and worthy to be killed. From that point on, they were looking for ways to murder him. Why? Why did Jesus go through that? He did it for me, for you, for all of us, for our babies, for those who went before us, those who will come after us. He did it to pay the debt, the payment for our sin. Because nothing we can do can scrub that mess clean. He took our place. See, here's the reality. The reality is, in this story, we are the criminals. We are the thugs. We are the robbers. If you notice, no names are, are, are attached to those criminals on the right or the left. They don't have a name like Tom or Demetrius. There's no Felipe or Anton. There's no Ryan or Timothy attached to those names because we are all guilty. We are all criminals. The Bible says this in Romans 3.23, For everyone has sinned, missed the mark, and fallen short of God's glorious standard, which is perfection. I ain't ma made perfection yet. I haven't met anybody that made perfection. And anybody who's telling you that they are perfect, we all know that they're just full of it. Right? We know some people like that. We're like, you. And here it is. We are all criminals. We have all sinned. We are all guilty. Before God, we, we can't. There's no possible way that we can be perfect. The second reality is we are all damned. The wages of sin is death. Romans 6.23, the first part of that scripture. Sin brings the death curse. Not simply physically, not simply emotionally, but spiritually. Eternal separation from God. The hell, damned. That's where the word comes from originally before we kind of flipped it and made it a whole bunch of other things. So we are all criminals. We are all damned thirdly. But we all have access to salvation. The wages of sin is death. The payment is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Whenever in any sentence or any conversation for that matter, that you're in a conversation with somebody and they say, you know what, I really like what you have on, but, right? That doesn't mean like you just kind of back up. You're like, okay, get ready for the shade. Get ready, get ready for the hate. Get ready. I, I, sometimes we like physically get ready. Other times we mentally or emotionally get ready for something is about to change to undo what was said before. I love you, baby. Tomorrow's my anniversary. I could say to my, my wife, Joanna, baby, I love you, but she don't want to hear but. Here's a beautiful, here's a beautiful but. <laughs> But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The reality is this. We are all are criminals. We all are guilty. We all are damned. That's our due punishment for sin, not meeting the mark. And yet we all have access to salvation. Incredibly hopeful. This is a, the hope of ultimately Easter. This is why Jesus came. This is why he went through it all. This is why he died. Not simply going through the pain physically and emotionally of being on the cross, but the utter <sighs> agony of taking on the sin of the world. But here's the thing. My issue is not one of ignorance of these things. My issue is one of obedience. In our life, in our society, in, in, in anything, 
Our issue is not primarily one of ignorance. It's an issue of obedience. It's not an issue of what we do not know about these things. It's an issue of implementation of these things. Even if you never heard about Jesus until tonight, tonight you know enough by what God's word has said and hopefully in broken ways that I've tried to explain that you are not ignorant and do not have enough knowledge to apply what his word says. One of the things that irritates me the most about my kids, right? <laughs> this weekend their cousin was over, had a great time. And I told him, my wife told him, she said, kids, you need to go downstairs and you need to clean your room. Then when you're done, you go outside and there's some things you need to clean up. Then you can play. <laughs> Y'all know what they did. They played, and I'm hollering out the window. What did mama say? <laughs> I don't know. I said, okay, so let me remind you. You're supposed to clean your room, and then you're supposed to clean up the stuff that's in the yard, and then you can play. Okay, 30 minutes later. Nothing. Daddy, Poppy, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't hear you. I didn't, I didn't, I'm like, mm-mm. Uh-uh, mm, uh -uh. mm, mm You know you chose to not apply. One of my favorite examples, because we all can relate, is bad breath. I might be kicking right now because I've been speaking for a minute. That's why I got a piece of gum in my pocket ready to pop that bad boy in at the end. But the reality is, we can know we got bad breath, but it doesn't do anything until we do the application to solve it. We all are criminals. We all deserve to be damned. We all have access to salvation. It doesn't have to be that way. But my issue, our issue, is not one of ignorance, but one of obedience. Last week, uh, we had Gene Calderon here, and he was given uh, a talk on evidence to prove the existence of, of God, the existence of Jesus, uh, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Great, great stuff. And one of the things that he said that I wrote down, and I'm paraphrasing it here, is this. We have faith because of the evidence, not contrary to or in the absence of it. We can have faith in God. We can have faith in this. Not because of, in the face of a lack of evidence, or in the absence of it, or uncertainty, but because there is overwhelming evidence that Jesus is who he says he is and did what he did. Yeah. That should get an amen. That's all right. Jesus' resurrection was proof of what he had to say. Jesus' resurrection showed victory over sin and death. Where, oh, death is your sting? Drops the mic. Jesus' resurrecting sets him apart from every other prophet claim anything. Nobody can touch that. Jesus said, what? I'm laying it out here. I'm the way, the truth, the life. I'm going to die for your sins, but I'm not going to stay there. I'm about to get up. And when I get up, everything changes because now you have proof. It's something different when there's proof. Because sometimes we can do things and we just kind of assume or whatever, whatever, and we don't have proof. But when you know, when you know, when you know, when you know, oh, there's... That's worthy of, it's worthy of dying for. When I know that I know that I know that I love my wife, when I love my kids, I'd be willing to sacrifice my life for them. I'd be willing to stand in their place to do whatever it takes to defend them. Hope I don't have to do that. Because <laughs> I kind of like certain things about being alive.
1 Corinthians 5, 17. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. So what is our response to all this? What is our response to this whole thing of Jesus Christ, this whole thing of Easter? One of the things that we must understand is that we can be so close to salvation and still miss it. We can be so close to salvation and still miss it. Check homeboy on the, on the cross next to Jesus. He was right there. He was right there. Close. Closer than any of us have been physically to Jesus Christ, the side of heaven. He was right there and missed it. Matthew chapter 7, and this is a hard one, y'all. Take a deep breath. Matthew chapter 7, 21 through 23. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Let me contemporize that a little bit. Won't there be people when they come face to face with their maker say, didn't I feed those poor people? Didn't I go to church? Jesus, did you see me on Easter when I could have been watching the NBA and having a barbecue with the fellas or could have been hanging and doing whatever else, watching whatever's on TV? Didn't you see me? Or maybe I went to Bible study. Maybe I'm in church every Sunday. And Jesus is like, good for you. But you missed it. You were that close. You had all this knowledge. You're doing certain things, but nothing ever changed your heart. Don't miss it. Not only can we be so close to salvation and still miss it, secondly, it's not about right words or actions, it's about the heart. John 3, 16 and 17 says this, for we know this is how we love, God loved the world, that he gave his one and only son, that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life, and God sent his son into the world not to judge it, but to save the world through him. In Romans 10, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe him in your heart, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it's believing in your heart that you are made right with God, and it's by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. Think back to this criminal on the cross. There was no tomorrow. There was no, let me get sobered up. There was no, let me change the music that I listen to. There was no, let me change the attire that I got on. There's no, let me put down the bud. There's no, let me stop sleeping around. There's no, there's none of that because that does not get you in relationship with Christ. Because there's no amount of scrubbing that can cleanse the sin stain in our heart. We can't do it. That's what makes Jesus so, so beautiful. This picture of believing in, in John 3, 16, and for, for God so loved the world that anyone who believes in him. It's not a mental thing. It's not knowledge because if it's knowledge, I'm really messed up because I don't often think I know very much about God and his word. There's a lot of other people that make me feel this big when they start speaking, when they start leading a Bible study, when they start talking and they start writing books. And I'm like, how do you know all that stuff? And I'm like, I feel dumb. There's people who tell me, Pastor, I don't know the right words to say. I don't know, I don't know any of that stuff. And Jesus doesn't care. 
Because the picture is this, John 3.16, that says, if you believe in me, the picture is not mental knowledge. The picture is a trust all open, all in. But the problem is, we don't want to go there too often. Let's just be real. When it comes down to it, we don't think we need Jesus. We're self-made. We got everything we need. Or we just take a little bit of Jesus. That picture of belief is not a little bit of Jesus. That's all in. All chips. All belts off. So the question for you tonight is this. What are you going to do with Jesus? He's provided the sacrifice. He's died. Not only took our place, took on the sins, our jacked up mentality, but rose from the grave, kicking death in his teeth, saying, you can't hold me. You don't need any other proof than that. There's an act of our will. Do we trust and believe in God? As imperfect as that is. Sometimes we get down and we believe, but then we kind of like, oh, I don't know. And we, and we just go up and down, up and down. That's part of growth. Just like a little kid learning to walk. They don't get up and start running a 40-yard dash. No. They stumble, they bust their lip, they, they go through stuff. That's, that's why it's so important that we don't just jump out the first time we go through stuff. That's why I tell people all the time that people say, Pastor, I don't know if I can come to church. I haven't been there in a long time. What would people say? And I say, I don't give a rip what they say. And if they say anything, you tell me and I'll tell them something because it's not. We all go through stuff. <laughs> Jesus is always like, come back, son, daughter. Don't let that garbage push you away. But the fact still remains. We've got to lay our heart to him. I don't know where all y'all are at with that. I don't know where you stand with Jesus. My guess is and I know for a fact, unless you don't understand English and understand the words coming out of my mouth, do you have enough knowledge that we cannot claim ignorance to the truth of who Christ is and what he wants out of our lives? The question is, are you going to be obedient to that? This is not a hallelujah, let's get happy type of Easter message. This is, this is, this is. Time is running out. Time is running out. I've watched too many people in my own neighborhood time run out, expire way too soon. And it doesn't even have to be in my neighborhood, in Glen Park, for that to happen. It could be in the richest neighborhood where people live to 175 years old, whatever. I don't care. The time is still running out. No matter the color, no matter the, the ethnicity, no matter the, the money amounts, no matter how easy life is here or how hard life is here, nothing compares to hell. And we all meet the same end without Jesus, but we all get to the same end with him. So what should your decision going to be? Are you going to ride with Jesus? Or are you going to say, hey, I, Pastor, I don't know it all. I don't, I don't know the words. I, 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 I still cuss. I still get crazy. I still, I still want to drink my fit. Whatever. But I, there's something about Jesus that is just drawing me in my heart and it's making me very, very uncomfortable right now. I know that's the Holy Spirit of God speaking to your hearts and saying, son, daughter, come on. I love you. I tie for you. I kick death in the teeth for you. I'm raised again. 
One day I'm coming back for those who are mine. And we're going to ride. But are you going to be on that team? Or is the ish of your life that beautiful that you want to cling on to that? Let's pray. As we pray, I'm not going to ask you to come up forward. I'm not doing that at all tonight. But what I'm going to ask you, if you're, you're here tonight, you're like pastor, you man, something about that connected with me, and I need Jesus. I don't know the words to say, but I need Jesus. If that's you, simply just raise your hand. I'm not going to make you stand up. I'm not going to make you say anything. I just, I just want to know how to pray for you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And for those who, who have raised their hand, I want to just challenge you to do something. Not here, not now. But if you're serious about Jesus, I want you to connect. Maybe you just visited here and you got a home church somewhere else, and I'm cool with that. You connect with your pastor and you say, hey, I'm, I'm, I want to follow Jesus. Help me on this road. I guarantee you, if he's a pastor of any measure, they'll be more than happy to do that. If you don't have a church home, I'll be more than happy to walk you through that. You just holler at me at the end. Whenever you can get information of how to contact me, I would love to walk with you in that process. That's worth it all to me. But know this, you can simply say, Jesus, I believe you. And I want to follow you. Forgive me of my ish. Forgive me of my stuff. I accept what you've done. It's simple. That's it. For others of you, you simply need the encouragement that Jesus has risen. And maybe you're in a situation, whether it's relational, maybe whatever it happens to be, and you need to know and you need to be reminded the assurance that Jesus has risen from the dead and kicked death in the teeth, conquered it, destroyed it. And no matter what you're going through now, your, 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 your physical, your emotional, your financial, your relational status may not change, but you can have confidence in God that he will see you through. And some of you need that tonight. Receive that from God's word. Receive that. Identify with that dude on the cross. His situation didn't change except for the most important one, his eternal destination. Take comfort in that tonight. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for the truth of your word. Your, your word cuts right to the heart of the issue. You don't, you don't, it, it's, you don't play it. You're right to the heart and sometimes it has to kick our rear ends because we need the truth to be real and in our face and expose some BS stuff we believe about ourselves and about you. And we need the light of your word to shine and expose that junk. God, I pray that you would continue to work in hearts here. God, I pray that we would not shut you off when we leave out of here and we go about our business. God, I pray that we still seek you out. We won't just shut you off. God, I pray for those that raise their hand and said they want to be following Jesus. God, I pray that you would help them to be bold and take the initiative to connect with other believers, to connect with myself, or if it's another pastor, to connect with them and say, hey, help me walk through this. Or maybe it's not even a pastor, but another person that is following you, that walks with them and shows them, hey, this is how it's done. God, I pray that you protect them. I pray that they continue to follow you. Lord, and for those of us just struggling, God, we just, we just, we just going through. God, may we receive encouragement from your word tonight. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.